Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. Today's video is about one of Britain's most notorious prisoners. A man whose escapades have earned him the nicknames Hannibal the Cannibal, the Wolfman of Wakefield and Brain Eater. Despite his terrible crimes, as you will see, the details of his own imprisonment might be the most disturbing thing about this case. This is the true story of Robert John Maudsley. Robert Maudsley's early life is similar to a lot of other serial killers. Severe abuse in early childhood seems to have contributed to his murderous tendencies in later life. Born in 1953 in Liverpool, he spent his earliest years in a Catholic orphanage called Nazareth House. When he was eight, his parents took him back into their home, and it was here that he was subjected to a daily barrage of physical and sexual abuse. The abuse mostly came from his father, although Maudsley claims that it was almost always encouraged and instigated by his mother. As the youngest child in the house, he received the worst of the beatings. When asked about his childhood, Maudsley would later recall. All I remember is the beatings. Once I was locked in a room for six months and my father only opened the door to come in to beat me four to six times a day. He used to hit me with sticks or rods and once he bust an air rifle over my back. A year after moving back in with his parents, Robert Morsley was taken out of the family home and put into the foster care system. At the age of 16, he ran away to London. Alone and mentally disturbed in an unfamiliar city, he became homeless and addicted to drugs. To fund his drug habit, he began prostituting himself. His work as a prostitute led to further abuse at the hands of older men. A bloodthirsty resentment was growing inside him and his mental health spiralled out of control. In the following few years, he would attempt to take his own life at least three times and was once admitted to a psychiatric hospital after taking an overdose. By the age of 21, the urge to commit acts of violence had solidified in his mind. On the 13th of March 1974, Robert Maudsley left his home carrying a knife in his pocket. In his own words, he says, I went to the West End area. I went there to hurt someone. I went to the Texas Pancake House, Coventry Street, and I took a knife with me, but I could find no one. So I went to the Playland Arcade, the home for homosexuals. I walked about but could find no one to hurt. Maudsley then met a friend named John Farrell. Farrell invited Maudsley back to his place and they both went back to his house at Wood Green. Whilst John Farrell was in the kitchen making tea, Maudsley took the knife out of his jacket pocket and hid it within easy reach under the bed. Maudsley would later describe his urge to kill John Farrell. After we had tea and talked, we went to bed. Johnny got into bed and went to the side nearest the wall, and I got in the open side to be near the knife. We started to kiss and masturbate each other, and I thought of killing him, but I went on masturbating him thinking that the feeling might go, and that I might not feel like killing him in the morning. After we finished kissing and masturbating, we both tried to sleep, but we were both restless and started to whisper to each other. Then we went to sleep, but I still had the feeling I wanted to hurt him. Sometime the next morning, John Farrell starts talking about all the boys that he'd brought back to his house over the years. He pulls out a suitcase stuffed with Polaroid photographs of his various conquests and he places it on the bed. As Maudsley is looking through these photographs, a strange feeling comes over him. He rushes at Farrell and stabs him in the chest. John Farrell makes a mad dash for the exit, but he trips over an armchair and bangs his head. As he lies on the floor, Maudsley stands over him and stabs him several more times in the side of the neck. With Farrell dead, Maudsley washed his hands in the upstairs bathroom and left the house. Over the course of that day, he would ring the police several times confessing to the murder, but he was unable to give them the exact location of the house. Eventually they came and picked him up and he was able to take them to the scene of the crime. At this point he was taken into custody. Now, there's some speculation that the photographs in John Farrell's suitcase were actually of children and Maudsley killed him because he hated paedophiles. 
Reading through Maudsley's confession, I can't find any mention of photographs of children. He says they were pictures of boys, which could simply mean photographs of young men rather than underage children. Still though, many articles online state that John Farrell was a paedophile, but I can't find the original source for that accusation. Even the Wikipedia page says that Farrell picked up Maudsley for sex and showed him pictures of children he had sexually abused. It links to a book as a source for this claim, however this book, as well as spelling Maudsley's name incorrectly throughout, makes no mention of these pictures at all, so I don't know why they've used it as a citation. A lot of online sources have tried to paint Maudsley as a sort of heroic figure that goes around killing nonces and rapists. There's a pretty good article on the Frank Report that breaks down a lot of these claims and points out that there isn't really a lot of evidence to support them. Although I should point out that this Frank Report article has a photo of Maudsley at the end and actually it's a photo of a completely different murderer called Roy Whiting. Perhaps their fact checking abilities aren't so great either. Anyway, after his arrest Robert Maudsley was found to be so mentally ill that he was unfit to stand trial and he was sent to Broadmoor, a high security psychiatric hospital. Three years into his stay at Broadmoor, Maudsley killed again. On the 2nd of February 1977, after a football match between inmates, Robert Maudsley and his accomplice David Cheeseman took another inmate named David Francis hostage in the locker room. When nurses tried to enter, they found that Maudsley had barricaded the doors. As with the John Farrell murder, most articles online say that David Francis was a convicted child molester. I haven't been able to find any sources to confirm it for sure, but maybe there is some truth to it and I just can't find it. Over the following nine hours, Maudsley and Cheeseman tortured David Francis. Nurses reported looking in through a window and seeing Francis tied to a chair whilst Maudsley kicked him in the stomach over and over. What other tortures they subjected him to isn't widely reported. One book suggests that they started electrocuting him. Other reports say that nurses heard David Francis begging to be killed. The standoff ended with Maudsley strangling Francis with a garrote, then he held up the body at the window for the staff to see. Now this leads us on to another bit of Robert Maudsley lore that's often repeated online but might not be completely true. The most common version of this story is that when the guards eventually broke down the door, they found David Francis' body with its skull cracked open like an egg with a spoon jutting out of the wound. Part of his brain was missing because Robert Maudsley had been eating it. In Geoffrey Wansell's book Pure Evil he says that in reality, Maudsley did not eat any part of his victim's brains. One prison officer who worked with him explained that Maudsley had in fact made a makeshift weapon by splitting a plastic spoon in half to create a rough pointed weapon. He then killed his fellow Broadmoor inmate by ramming it into his victim's ear, penetrating the brain. Inevitably the plastic spoon blade was covered in gore, which was alleged to be his brains. Whilst this is a pretty horrific account, it is a far cry from the cannibalistic story that usually does the rounds. After killing David Francis, Robert Maudsley was transferred to Wakefield Prison. The following year he committed his most brazen killings. On the 29th of July 1978, Maudsley invited another inmate named Solney Darwood into his cell. He wrapped a garrote around Darwood's neck and began strangling him. As he lay choking on the ground, Maudsley stabbed him in the throat with a makeshift knife. When Darwood was dead, Maudsley hid the body under his bed, washed his hands and tried to invite other prisoners into his cell. When nobody took the invitation, he walked down the wing and into the cell of another prisoner named William Roberts. He started hacking at Roberts' skull with his makeshift knife, then smashed his head against the wall until he stopped moving. Although William Roberts wasn't killed outright, his wounds were so severe that he died in hospital 18 hours later. When he'd finished his attacks, Robert Maudsley walked up to the guard's desk, placed the bloody knife on the counter and calmly told them that the next roll call would be short two people. The crimes of these last two victims are often cited to bolster the idea that Maudsley was only killing people that he thought deserved it. 
Solney Darwood is reported as being in prison for murdering his wife, William Roberts, for molesting a four-year-old girl. This book gives a bit more information on their crimes, which seems to corroborate this information. Although this is the book that spells Mortley's name wrong, the details of these crimes seem detailed enough to be legit. With four murders under his belt, three of which had been committed whilst he was in high or maximum security facilities, Maudsley was deemed to be too dangerous to be kept around other prisoners, and so he began one of the longest stretches of living entombment ever recorded. He was placed into solitary confinement for a few years, during which time a special cell was constructed just for Robert Maudsley, deep underground in the basement of Wakefield Prison. The cell was completed in 1983. It was about 5 metres square with large reinforced observation windows. A steel door opens into a perspex encased cage inside the cell making a sort of airlock system. Food is passed through a narrow slot in the perspex. There's a metal sink and toilet bolted to the ground, a concrete slab for a bed and a table and chair made from pressed cardboard. By all reports, it bears a striking resemblance to Hannibal Lecter's cell in Silence of the Lambs, although that film didn't come out for another eight years. For one hour a day, Robert Maudsley is allowed out of his cell, under heavy guard escort for exercise, and during this time he isn't allowed contact with any other prisoners. The remaining 23 hours of the day he spends alone in his cell. For many years during his imprisonment in that room, he was given very little in the way of entertainment. No TV or radio, nothing to break the silence, just four bare walls and the voices in his head. He was on occasion given a pen and paper so that he could write requests to the prison board. The writings revealed the desperate solitude of the cell. He wrote, I am left to stagnate, vegetate and to regress. My life in solitary is one long period of unbroken depression. As a consequence of my current treatment and confinement, I feel that all I have to look forward to is indeed psychological breakdown, mental illness and probable suicide. Why can't I have a budgie instead of flies, cockroaches and spiders which I currently have? I promise to love it and not eat it. Why can't I have a television in my cell to see the world and learn? Why can't I have any music tapes and listen to beautiful classical music? Why can't I have amazing pictures on my walls in solitary rather than the dirty, damp patches I currently have? If the prison service says no, then I ask for a simple cyanide capsule, which I shall willingly take and the problem of Robert John Maudsley can easily and swiftly be resolved. Briefly in the early 90s, he was transferred to Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight. He was still kept in total isolation, but he was seen by a psychiatrist named Dr. Bob Johnson. Over the course of three years, Dr. Johnson gained Maudsley's trust and recorded a series of interviews with him. I'm able to talk about things, a lot more, a lot more things today yeah. than I was able to say six or more, nine months ago. We see the thing, Bob, I, I, well, I say I know, I know, I know in the past when I've tried to sort of face these things, you know, I, 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 I'm just capable of doing anything, Bob, no, as the adult here, exactly. and, that, and that's what I've got to be cautious Absolutely. of, you know. Absolutely right. It's very difficult to tell what Maudsley is saying. By this point, his lack of human contact had begun to take its toll on his communication skills. Maudsley seemed to make progress with Dr. Johnson, but after three years, he was suddenly transferred back to his tomb in Wakefield Prison, and he's remained there ever since. For over 40 years, he has been kept in total solitary confinement, most of it in the same room in the basement of Wakefield Prison. From reading recent articles, it does sound like he now has some form of entertainment in his cell, a TV and a PlayStation 2, plus he is occasionally allowed visits from family members. Even so, 40 plus years in solitary confinement is an extraordinarily brutal punishment. Apparently before Maudsley even committed his first murder, he told psychiatrists that he heard voices in his head telling him to kill his parents. When you think what 40 years of isolation will have done to a mind that was so broken to begin with, it's amazing that he has any sanity left at all. 
Now, it's not my intention to paint Robert Maudsley in a sympathetic light, or to demonise him any more than he's already done with his own actions. Reading through articles about Maudsley, he's either painted as some sort of heroic nonce destroyer or an inhuman monster who deserves everything he gets. I wanted to unpack this story in a more neutral way, however you feel about it afterwards is up to you. It brings up the question of what we do with people like Robert Maudsley. People that clearly need some kind of psychiatric help but are too dangerous to be left around other people. Can people like that ever be rehabilitated? Do we just lock them up forever? Do we let them die? That's pretty much all I've got on this case. It's been difficult to put the details together because almost every article and book that I read seems to say completely different things. Hopefully I've pieced it together in a coherent way. Anyway, big thanks to everyone who is supporting the channel. I've been thinking about what I can do as a reward for patrons. I've thought about doing a giveaway where I pick some random names and they get a prize. I got some keyrings made and I only got 10 made, so I think I'll just give them out as prizes. I'll pick three winners in this video, three in the next and so on. Once I run out of keyrings I'll have to think of something else to give away. I'll throw in some stickers and a little drawing by me. I know it's nothing too amazing but it's just a bit of fun. Right, here we go, let's do a giveaway. I've got every active patron's name in here. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm gonna pick three of them at random. If I get the same name twice, I'm gonna pick again. But uh, the first three people that come up will get this amazing prize. All right, let's see. Okay, James Blandford, you are the first winner. Let's pick another. Michael Pritchard Jr. Congratulations to you. And the third name... D. Griever. Congratulations. I'm sure you are absolutely thrilled. So, there we go. Congratulations to those people. Thank you for watching. Until next time, goodbye.